So in the 15 minutes I have today, I'm just going to make three comments. Um, the first comment is going to be more about some of the implications of the nation state law. So, and then the second one is going to be about some of the people who opposed the law even though they agree with it, mainly uh, the group of politicians and intellectuals known as liberal Zionists. And the final point, I'm going to discuss why they oppose this, um, bas this basic law. Um, to begin with the act, uh, with the basic law itself, as you know, it's a basic law, which means that it is a constitutional law. It's a law that has the power of a constitution, um, uh, recognized as such by the Israeli Supreme Court. But upon reading the uh, basic law itself, and for anybody who is familiar with uh, the Israeli uh, legal landscape, we'll see that the basic law itself does not really change that much uh, in the legal landscape. What it does mostly is that it reasserts certain principles that have long been part of the consensus among Israeli uh, and uh, or mostly Jewish Israeli um, uh, citizens. And uh, if we can, t if we'll take some examples to demonstrate this point, um, we can see that the basic law refers to uh, de or declares some of the principles or refers to the sum of the principles in the Declaration of Establishment of the State of Israel, mainly um, the self right to self determination of Jewish people in. Um, what they call the land of Israel. But then also, <clears throat> we can see that this right has long been established in Israeli law. It is part of the declaration of the establishment of the state from 1948. It was repeated multiple times, many times, in the decisions of the Supreme, Courts of Israel, Supreme Court of Israel. Um, the only difference that it makes actually here is that uh, the basic law adds uh, a new category because the basic law talks about exercising the natural, cultural, religious, and historic right to self-determination. Now, the religious right to self-determination is a new one. So that's the only novel um, category here. Um, and even if we look at the idea of self-determination. We can see that um, in Israeli legal scholarship, in the li Israeli legal literature, in the decisions of the Supreme Court, and also in, those, um, in the writings of those who are known as liberal Zionists, we can see that when they talk about self-determination, they mean exclusive self-determination of Jews only, which means that in no scenario uh, in the past, the idea of self-determination of everybody who lives in uh, the territory of the state of Israel participates in the right to self-determination. Another example which demonstrates that there hasn't really been much change is the section that relates to language. Uh, in Israel, um, by um, Israel, after 1948, adopted mandatory legislation. So all the mandatory le legislation, with some exceptions, became part of Israeli law. That also included um, the sec relevant sections relating to language. And based on this adoption of uh, the mandate legislation, Arabic was a form of language. But even though Arabic was a form of language, the Supreme Court of Israel said, yes, it is a form of language, but Hebrew is the principal language. Arabic is a formal language with distinct and added value, which means that even though the uh, relevant section in order, in the, what was known as the Ordering Council, talked about two formal uh, official languages, the Supreme Court introduced a hierarchy. Hebrew is the principal language, Arabic is, a form, is a, an official language. Now, what did the basic law, the new basic law do? The basic law talked about uh, 
uh, Hebrew being the official language and Arabic being a language with special status, which is not really any different from what was mentioned by the Israeli Supreme Court, introducing that hierarchy between the languages. Another example I'm going to mention is the issue related to um, settlement. So section 7 of the basic law states that the state sees the development of Jewish settlement as a national value and shall act in order to promote its establishment and development. Now this position, which is now part of the basic law, we can see that it is not dissimilar from uh, positions that were presented sometimes in the case law, sometimes uh, in the um, literature or legal literature um, and extrajudicial writings of judges. And here I'm quoting and bringing a quote from uh, Aharon Barak, who was a former um, Supreme Court Chief Justice, who's no, he's seen as a towering figure in uh, academy, who has a, an international following. Many people cite, them, cite him as their hero. And he's kind of like a modern day prophet of Israeli uh, liberalism. And in uh, 2002, in the 34th Zionist Congress, he gave us a speech where he talked about what makes a state a Jewish state. And he says that it is a state that promotes Jewish settlement and, quote, a state that redeems state land for Jewish settlement. Um, so, essentially, what we're saying, seeing here is that the basic law just codified or just put into words that are now basic law, what was in an existing legal principle. And to also demonstrate the point that, so because one of the arguments is that this is going to increase discrimination, but discrimination already exists in a range of um, legal strategies that are meant to um, uh, discriminate without actually uh, officially sanctioning discrimination. So, and there was one decision in the year 2000 that was, uh, that uh, declared um, some sorts of discrimination legal, was circumvented by um, legislation in, in the Knesset, in addition to the fact that the protection that um, this decision declared was not really that strong. So, this is just to make the point that um, if we look at the legal situation before, the constitutional principles before, the enactment of this basic law and the basic law, we'll see that they're almost identical. So in, legal, in the legal sense, it did not really make a lot of difference. Probably politically, uh, it does, or to some extent also it emboldens people, emboldens judges to take certain positions, but the principles are, have already been there and have long been there. Now the second um, point I'm going to make is about um, the category of liberal Zionists, which is uh, a group of politicians and intellectuals um, who of course believe in Zionism, but they try to balance the uh, Jewish only right to self-determination in Israel with some liberal democratic principles. Um, of course, which is not a, uh, an easy task. It's a very complicated task to balance these two. Usually they end with uh, failure, but then the end goal of the exercises, intellectual exercises that they have, um, is to demonstrate that uh, Israel, despite the fact that it constitutionally favors Jews, their culture, collective rights, and legally discriminates against uh, the Palestinian population is a liberal democracy. Democracy. Now, there are a number of ways that they do this, usually either by comparing to other countries, mostly Eastern Europe, or looking at the idea of uh, equality and then um, analyzing the hell out of it so that equality does not mean equality and discrimination does not mean discrimination, and um, start going in circles. Um, to get to that conclusion. 
Um, but uh, the end goal basically here is just they want to reconcile the values of democracy and Jewish uh, self-determination. Now, most of these people who, to sub who subscribe to this um, uh, worldview were opposed to the basic law. So we have people like uh, um, uh, Yuli Tamir, uh, Amnon Rubinstein, um, and others who are well known in this category who were opposed to it. And even though they're opposed to it, the irony here is that most of these people who are known as liberal Zionists are actually the people who helped establish all of the principles that are now part of the basic law. So if we look at uh, um, uh, people like, for example, um, Aharon Barak. Aharon Barak is probably one of the most important people who uh, established the meaning of what Jewish and democratic means and also tried to insert some liberal values in it. And, um, and even though, as I said, he's seen as you know, modern day and liberal prophet, uh, when the first, when the basic law was first introduced in the Knesset, we can see that the uh, member of Knesset who introduced it um, justified the basic law by saying that I'm actually taking text from Barak's speeches. Uh, so we can see how, so that this is one example. Um, other examples also, the principles themselves. If we look at the literature of this group of people, liberal Zionists, we'll see that most of it is uh, centers around justifying things like discrimination, explaining that discrimination is not really discrimination, um, why all of the things that Israel does are okay. If there's a problem, then there's a problem that could be dealt with very easily. Now, these same people are the ones uh, who are now opposed to the law even though we can see that they actually sowed the seeds for this uh, act by basically providing the intellectual cover and the intellectual justifications for all of the elements in the basic law. Now, my last point is, so how come they're so opposed to it if we can see that they are actually the intellectual uh, parents of this basic law? even though um, they want to dissociate themselves from it. Um, so if they agree with all the principles, then why they're opposed to it? And why did this basic law offend their liberal sensibilities, but other things that the state did did not offend their liberal sensibilities? For example, the expulsion of the Bedouin communities uh, in the Naptop. We did not see them being outraged and writing against it or demonstrating against it uh, when it took place. Um, the uh, acts that prohibit family reunification, we did not see them writing against it. In fact, they were some of the people leading the justification for it. They are the ones who wrote uh, in legal journals and books saying that it is okay. We did not see them also um, uh, saying anything about the Nakba. We did not see them say much about the uh, laws that um, uh, said that participation in boycotts uh, are illegal, is illegal. So one conclusion that can, uh, that emerged from their writings is that they're more concerned with image and appearance. So if we can see, if we take an example Professor Amnon Rubinstein, who was the president of Tel Aviv University, a member of Knesset, and also a, a minister for about uh, four years, and also probably one of the most important constitutional law scholars in the country. He says, or he, he writes, that everyone who reads the bill understands that it will help BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanction Campaign Against Israel, and increase Israel's isolation in the West and within Jewish diaspora. Another example is Professor Shlomo Avneri of the Hebrew University, um, 
who uh, was concerned that this law is going to increase the tension in Israel between Jews and Palestinians, but also added that this will be the cause of significant damage internationally. Yael Tamir, who is also an academic and a former minister from the Labour Party, um, adds that the new, uh, leg- uh, new basic law undermines Israel's definition as a democratic state and expands the growing gap between Israel and the Western world. So we can see that um, the main concern is not really uh, the ethno-religious and inherently exclusionary principles and also the uh, entrenchment of Israel's um, colonial nature and policy. Um, The main problem is that (coughs) uh, this act actually demonstrates that Israel is closer to apartheid than democracy. It's closer more to white supremacists like Richard Spencer than uh, Martin Luther King. Because this basic law, in 340 words, makes the argument that hitherto one needed thousands of pages to demonstrate. So it's now a position that cannot be compared away, and liberal Zionists have their fingers prints all over it. Thank you.